All right, what to wear today? Go into the old wardrobe. Not bad, a little warm. There we go. Pop a color, business casual vibe. That's not quite right. Hmm, I do have a lot of clothes. And I know the production of clothes creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Ah! Too casual. Back it up. There we go. We also know that organic fibers take a lot less to produce. So that's got me wondering, how is going back to natural fabrics the way to be fashion forward in our climate crisis? Welcome to one of my favorite thrift shops and get ready to see a side of Johanna I have tried to keep hidden as I fought the weather girl stigma for decades. The Johanna that loves clothes. Ooh, I said it. A recent report found that a planet-friendly wardrobe should consist of just 74 garments with new purchases limited to five items per year. Houston, we have a problem. Here's the other truth. According to the UN, the fashion industry is responsible for 10% of global emissions. That's more than aviation and shipping combined. And the World Bank suggests that global clothing sales could go up by 65% by 2030. Most of fashion's environmental impact comes from the use of raw materials. Synthetic fibers like polyester require 342 million barrels of oil every year. Add to that the chemical dyes and the massive amounts of water used. I mean, making one pair of jeans, for example, uses about 20,000 bottles of water. Fast fashion is only adding to the problem by stepping up the pace of design. Collection launches are no longer seasonal. New inventory is pretty much constant. And as a result, we're buying more, 60% more than in the 2000s, and throwing away more. And get this, less than 1% of used clothing is actually recycled into new garments. So what if I just buy all the secondhand clothes and we only make new garments that can actually be recycled, you know, organic fabrics. To find out if there's a real solution here, we met up with Rain Zhang, who studies materials engineering to learn more about how important the textiles themselves are when it comes to climate change. We started our chat, fittingly, on a rooftop garden at the University of British Columbia. When did you first you know, become interested in the fashion industry and, and its impact? I live right next to a mall. <laughs> and so I had gotten into a habit back home of just, you know, going for a casual walk and picking up something from the store and coming home and liking it for a week or two and then just forgetting about it. And Story of my youth too. <laughs> yep. Right, right. Okay, it's not just me. No. <laughs> um, and then I, it was COVID and I remember watching a documentary called The True Cost. And this movie really highlighted not just the cost, the, the price that we pay for our clothes, but also the social and environmental cost that it takes to get the cheap clothing to our hands. And that was not something that I wanted to continue to contribute to more. And from that moment, you, you made small and, and bigger changes? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that led to my materials engineering degree because everything around you is made up of some kind of material. There's so much room for improvement to make the process of uh, making clothes more kind to the environment, to the people, um, to everybody. Okay, let's go down the rabbit hole. To attempt a brief history of textiles is to attempt the history of civilization. It's no small feat. And it's a history as wrapped in culture, class, and gender politics as it is in science and exploration. So we better get started. In the beginning, humans wore animal skins as clothes, but around 11,000 years ago, we began growing crops for textiles, and we could truly regulate our body temperatures as we migrated to new climates. Fibers that had to be spun into yarn that would then be looped, woven, knitted into fabrics, and that changed everything. I love your color palette. One of the most famous examples of textile production 
silk breeders in China that eventually led to the Silk Road trade route, 8,000 kilometers connecting China to the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, Europe in the Middle Ages made great progress in the working and dyeing of wool, which was used for outerwear with linen close to the skin. Then came tailoring, buttons and lace, which drew textiles closer to the body. And with that, the rise of fashion. And of course, it was in part the demand for cotton that drove the transatlantic slave trade. Great Britain watched the outcome of the American Civil War closely to see what it would mean for their cheap supply. During the Industrial Revolution, fabric making shifted to mass production and assembly lines and sewing machines streamlined the process. Labor issues have gone hand in hand with textile production ever since. In recent decades, it's fast fashion, globalization, and consumerism that have taken the spotlight. This is but a mere sampling of the history of the world, I mean textiles, a history that reflects the technologies, cultures, and customs of civilizations through time. Rain, how would you describe the fashion industry's carbon footprint? It's massive mm -hmm. to say the least and it's a lot larger than what a lot of people think and just as an example if you look at the uh, where your shirt is made from it's probably made from a country in the global south and most global south countries do rely on uh, coal or fossil fuels as their main source of energy so that's where the main amount of um, carbon emissions come from where the material is sourced where it's where it comes from, how it's made, um, even the people who are making it. Um, there's a huge, huge social and environmental impact there. Um, for example, 10 years ago, um, it was the Rana Plaza incident that happened mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. And it unfortunately killed about 1,000 uh, and 100 uh, workers and injured 2,000 and 2, more. And this was just a really big wake up call to the world. So we've just gone from a beautiful rooftop garden, organic material all around us to where are we now? So we are currently inside of a electro spinning lab that produces nanofibers. Okay, and this is one of the technologies that exists right now that, that might be a solution to fashion and climate change. Can you tell us more about these technologies? Mm -hmm. Right now there's two main processes that um, clothing can be recycled in. And so that's mechanical and chemical. Um, and so this lab focuses mainly on chemical processes, uh, which dissolves the textiles into a solution and then repurposes it from there. Uh, whereas the mechanical side, um, they will shred the clothing most likely mm. and separate uh, the fibers to re-spin. However, the mechanical um, recycling process, you rarely can get back to the same quality of fibers as it was before because when you're shredding, you're decreasing the length of the fibers, making it much, much harder to re-spin to the same um, quality of yarn as it was before. Is this becoming chemical? more popular? Like where are we at with it in the world? So we're currently um, in the process of researching um, upcycling of uh, cotton waste in this lab and we're trying to turn that into nanofibers. And nano nanofibers are fibers that are about 500 times smaller than the diameter of your hair. And it has a lot of really, really cool applications like tissue engineering and water filtration. And we call this process upcycling because um, in mechanical recycling, you, um, you decrease the quality of the fibers, mm -hmm. so you're downcycling it. Whereas oh. here, you're upcycling, you're increasing the value. Can you show us the process? First, we have little pieces of cotton that's cut up and we put into a solution. Um, this can be a typical acid that can dissolve the textile and create and get rid of all the natural dyes and artificial dyes that are on there to strip it completely. And then you put it into a syringe um, and then you place the syringe right over here and the machine turns on and you slowly, slowly, slowly push the syringe and as the syringe pushes, it ejects a very, very thin, like a thread almost that goes onto this machine, which is spinning and it collects the fiber all across this spindle. You've got an example of what would come out of this? Yes. So we have it here and you can see it's very fine, almost impossible oh, to see wow. with the eye. It does look like silkworm does, material. Yeah. It's very soft, very delicate. So we're trying to figure out um, what combination, what uh, works best to create the best um, material properties on these fibers.